this is not a review. In this video, my opinion will matter. Instead, you're going to experience the Samsung Galaxy S20 Ultra for yourself, and you're going to know about everything from gaming, to the performance, to the cameras, to the screen, to Bixby, to Samsung Dex, and to many, many more things you don't even know that you don't even know yet. Basically, if you watch this video from the beginning to the end, then you can say you've used and experienced the S20 Ultra, and you'll even pass the lie detector test. Okay? You ready? Well, let's start with the phone itself. First, it's big, very big. It's an S20, yes, but it's the size of a Note. In fact, it has the biggest screen on any Samsung Galaxy S or Note phone, including the Note 10 Plus. This means it's definitely a two-handed device, although it doesn't have to be if you really don't want it to. Whether you want it to or not though, it either wouldn't fit in your pocket or it'll take up most of the space in there. Ladies, you know how your pockets are, if you even have any. The Ultra would need to go in a purse or a bag. It is thin though, not as thin as before because it's packing a bunch of power inside that we'll talk about later, but it's about as thin as a regular pencil, maybe a little bit thicker. It's made of glass that's still slippery, but it's not as slippery as I thought in hand, although it really is on surfaces. And although design is subjective, I think most will agree it looks pretty sleek and premium. The cameras in the back definitely have a wow factor too, although that means they won't stay flat on the table. And they shouldn't stay flat on the table either. Samsung claims the glass is strong, and yeah that's cool, but whether you think it looks premium or not, I bet your bank account would think it's premium, because it costs $1400 right now. So you should definitely not use it without a case. No need to find out if the screen is strong or not, it's best to find out by accident, not by carelessness. I won't be taking any chances, because the screen is beautiful. Too beautiful to break. It's a vibrant and sharp 6.9 inch 3K display, but out of the box, it comes in a half as sharp 1080p HD mode. So if you want it to be as sharp as possible, you'll have to head to the settings to change it. We're not gonna do that though. We're gonna leave it in 1080p HD mode because what we really wanna do is switch to the 120 hertz refresh rate. It only works in HD, not 3K, but it's crazy how this high of a refresh rate affects how smooth a phone can feel. Most of the phones have a 60 hertz refresh rate and they can be fast, but after using 120 hertz on the S20 Ultra, fast isn't good enough anymore. It's all about smooth. After you've tasted 120 hertz, there's a level of smoothness you get used to and it's hard to go back, believe me. Rather, it's very noticeable to go back. It might be hard for you or easy for you depending on how much you care about the smoothness of your phone. Because if you use the Ultra, then go back to a 60 hertz phone or just switch it to a 60 hertz mode, you know it's half as smooth as it was before. 50% less smooth, aka 50% laggier. I've tried this out myself though, and it's annoying for the first hour, but you could manage, I guess. Your eyes would adjust back, sort of. That was just about the only hour I used it without 120 hertz though, because it's just crappier. Although I still change the screen setting back to 3K and 60 hertz every time I want to watch YouTube videos in 3K 1440p resolution though. I wish I didn't have to, and Samsung let us use both the 3K resolution and the 120 hertz refresh rate, but with the Ultra, at least you basically have the best of both worlds, and you can use either whenever you feel like it. Refresh rates aren't the only reason the S20 Ultra screen is special though. Long story short, the reason the S20 Ultra screen is special is because it is the best phone screen in the world. Now, short story long, there are several reasons for this. First, it has the lowest screen reflectance rating at 4.4%. It has the most color accurate display for all devices tested by DisplayMate for sRGB and its DCI-P3 settings, aka natural and vivid mode, with DisplayMate's objective test deeming it visually indistinguishable from perfect. It also has the highest peak brightness on any phone at 1342 nits, which it can reach with auto brightness on and in the vivid mode. Oh, and it also broke 9 more DisplayMate records for the screen display. Like I said, it's the best screen in the world on a phone. And it's not just because of the refresh rate. Now that's a great thing, but normally when a screen is just so good, so colorful and so bright, it normally has bad battery life. So how's the battery life of the S20 Ultra? Well, we can always expect different answers to that question, depending on exactly how we use it. The way I've been using it though, has been intense. I mean, I've been putting it through its paces and trying to push it to its limit, and I've stressed it more than I've ever stressed the phone in a very long time, as you see from the rest of this video. Still though, I have never had the Ultra not last me an entire day, no matter how hard I've used it. I don't know any other phone that I would've been able to say that about. Now, I was definitely able to do this because of the big 5000 mAh battery, which is hard to drain, of course. It's surprisingly easy to fill up though, because it charges from 0 to 100% in about an hour with a 25 watt charger that comes in the box. It also has support for a 45 watt charger, but you have to buy that separately. And I haven't tested it myself, although I've seen tests online, and it seems it actually doesn't really perform so different from the 25 watt charger like you might expect. 
The 25 watt charger is plenty fast and it's really cool and convenient because you can charge it for one hour and no matter how much you use it basically, it still won't be dead after 24 hours, a whole day. Crazy. It also is able to wirelessly charge quicker than normal with Samsung's fast wireless charging and it can charge other wireless devices using reverse wireless charging, although it's very slow. Actually, no, it's not very slow anymore, it's just slow now because it's not like the 5 watts charging of before because now it's 9 watts, but it's still not the fastest. Now, if all of this isn't enough and you find your battery is still going to die, well, first of all, that means you use your phone more intensely than me. And if that's the case, then please stop lying. But you have multiple levels of power saving you can use, including a bare bones maximum power saving mode that should really, really help you save your battery when it's like an emergency. But I haven't actually needed to use any of them. I doubt you would too. It's nice that they're there though. What's also nice is Samsung didn't skimp out on the stereo speakers on the Ultra. Yes, there are two of them, but the top one is the impressive one to me. Not that it's better, but it's more impressive. First of all, it adds no extra bulk or bezel to the Ultra at all. And if you didn't know it's there, you might not even be able to see it. But with its size, you don't really expect much from it. I mean, I didn't, but it actually gets pretty loud by itself. Louder than you think, at least. Listen for yourself. Yes, the bottom speaker is still louder and it does sound fuller and it's better sounding overall, but when they play together, they're about the loudest phone speakers I've personally used in a while. They don't sound as full and bassy as the old HTC One speakers they used to make back in the day though, but no phone does these days. Sadly, they don't make them like that anymore. But the S20 Ultra is good and keeps up with today's competition. That's with Dolby Atmos on though. If you turn it off, you'll notice the sound get a good amount weaker, so you're gonna want to keep it on. There are different modes between Dolby Atmos as well, movie, music, and voice. You can also let the Ultra decide which one to use automatically. The thing is... It really doesn't matter which one you pick because with the speakers, I've checked and checked and checked and I cannot hear a difference. I don't think the different modes really do anything. With headphones though, it's a mixed bag. With my Sony headphones, I didn't really hear much of a difference at all between any mode and I didn't even hear a difference between having Dolby Atmos on or off entirely. But my Sonys do have a separate application to change its own sound settings. That might have been why it didn't work. That's what I thought at least. But it still didn't work for me with the headphones that comes in the box which actually don't sound bad by the way. I wanted to make sure though, so I tried my AirPod Pros and this time it worked. I could definitely hear the difference between Dolby Atmos on versus off. On truly did provide a louder, fuller experience. When I switched between the different modes though, then I could tell just a little bit of a difference. Actually, I'm not so sure. Okay, put on your headphones so I can show you how it actually sounds and you can hear it for yourself, okay? Your speakers won't be able to tell the difference too much. At least I don't think so. so Put on your headphones, okay? You ready? This is movie mode. This is music mode. And this is voice mode. Now I replicated this as best as I could, but my ears still can't tell much of a difference. But what about you? How about your ears? Can you tell the difference? Well, don't worry too much if you couldn't, because there's another Dolby Atmos mode when you won't need to question if there's a difference or not, and that's called Dolby Atmos for gaming. If it's a little confusing for you, I got you, let me explain. So it's Dolby Atmos, but for gaming. Yeah, you get it now? Cool. Yeah, it's pretty good, and it works well for both the speakers and with the headphones. It really does give a fuller, louder, and richer sound, and gets you more immersed in your gaming. But let's, let's talk about gaming later. Right now, let's talk about what most people will say is the most important part of this phone, unarguably the most controversial, and the most enlightening and longest part of this review. The cameras. Now, I've used these cameras a lot. I mean a lot. And I know them well, like intimately. You should know, there are two versions of the cameras on the S20 Ultra, and they're very, very, very different. There's the pre-update camera, and there's the currently very new post-update camera. 
Now you probably already know the pre-update camera. That means you know how disappointing it is in certain areas, like focusing, which should not be a problem in 2020, definitely. Another area you might not have known about though is dynamic range as well. Dynamic range could be pretty poor on the pre-update camera. Those were the two main problems faced by the pre-update cameras. Thankfully though, in the post-update cameras, it looks like they fixed this. This is the video test on the Samsung Galaxy S20 Ultra at 4K 60 frames per second after the update. And you can see I'm testing the focus here right now. Seems pretty good. Seems pretty okay. Quite fast it is. Yes, it is definitely improved after the update. So right now I'm testing the video mode at 4K 60 frames per second. You can see I'm moving around in order to test the camera looks pretty good to me again you guys are the judge here let me know your thoughts below in the comment section if i move around the object is still in focus and guys this is the 4k 60 frames per second video shot on the iphone 11 pro max just for comparison up against the samsung galaxy s20 ultra and again i'm testing out the focus and the focus is quite fast here too moving the video around you can see there was any difference or not again you guys are the judge here and I'm also testing out the dynamic range for the camera. This is 4K 60 frames per second once again. Moving to the objects. And the sound quality is again from the iPhone 11 Pro Max. Just let me know your thoughts below in the comment section. This is the short test video. So guys, I have captured some images from both of the cameras and on the left we have the S20 Ultra whereas on the right we have the iPhone 11 Pro Max. From what I can see, S20 has done here a better job. Just see the sky on both of the images and on the iPhone it is a bit blown out but on the S20 it is fine. But the downside with the S20 camera is that the darker parts of the image are way too dark. And again, you guys are the judge here. Let me know your thoughts below in the comment section. Moving on to the second image, both of them have done a great job. I'll let you guys choose the winner here, but overall the image of the S20 Ultra looks way sharper and also you can see saturated. Moving on to the last shot, here things are again in favor of the S20. I think they have improved the dynamic range with the update. Again, blue color of the sky is present on the S20, but it is blown out on the iPhone. No more of those blatant problems that took away from the good, fun things about the camera. I mean, Samsung packed a lot of features into this phone. I mean, as usual. Here are some you might not have known about. It has an augmented reality zone where it tries to do several things from decorating your apartment to taking measurements of stuff in the real world straight through your camera. It's fun, but it doesn't work so well sometimes. It has a hyperlapse mode with some manual settings, but the auto settings work pretty well. Even though it doesn't let you focus with steady shot on, with steady shot off, the video moves too fast for you to notice. It has a food mode, cause these days you know you gotta take pictures of your food and post it. If not, how would anyone know you've eaten? It can take your cornflakes from this to this. It has a feature called single take, where you just press a single button and the Ultra will automatically use a bunch of its features to capture the whole moment. Not like a regular picture, but like a whole moment. You can use all its cameras, record video, put a filter on a pic or two, etc. It's pretty cool but it won't do the same thing every time. So you can't guarantee you'll always get like an ultra wide shot, for example, if that's what you wanted. It's all up to the ultra's discretion. That's just like the scene optimizer, which is the first thing I've talked about that actually affects the ultra's regular picture taking mode, where it basically decides the scene of whatever you're taking a picture of and tries to get the best picture for that particular scene. Remember, I said it tries to. What it actually really does is make just about everything punchier. It'll detect food, put it in food mode, and then make your food punchier, cool. It'll detect it's dark, put it in semi-night mode, not proper night mode a lot of the times, and make your shot brighter and punchier. Eh, cool still. But it does that punchy thing everywhere, even when it shouldn't. Like it edits your pick for you, but in almost the same way, even if that's not what you want. And that's not what I wanted, so I turned it off for most of my time using it. I also turned off all the beauty modes, of course. But for the scene optimizer though, I actually think a lot of people will like it. People say stuff on YouTube, but in real life, a lot of people prefer punchy colors. So remember again, use your eyes and see the pictures you like. I'll be showing you a whole lot. The Ultra also has a portrait mode or live focus, which can work well, but isn't the best and isn't the most consistent. Not as much as pixels and iPhones in my experience. You also can't use the ultra wide camera for it. Only the main camera and the zoom camera in two times zoom mode will work for this. You can change the background blur afterwards though, so that's pretty cool. It also has a portrait mode in video or live focus video, which I thought would just be one big gimmick, but it seems like 
it's just live focus, but in video mode. Meaning I think it's maybe as consistent as live focus and picture mode, but in every single frame of the video. It might actually be even more consistent. Maybe it's not, but in video mode, it's almost too cool to notice, you know? Even when I was intentionally trying to get it to mess up, it still did pretty well. It even works with a selfie camera too. Oh, and the waterproofing of the Ultra really comes in handy when it comes to photography and videography. Wait, 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 it's actually not waterproof. It's water resistant with a rating of IP68, which means it's rated for being submerged five feet underwater for 30 minutes. In real life though, it might as well be waterproof. But if you mess your phone up, the most I'm gonna say is like, oh man, sucks, sorry about that. And I don't think my apology is gonna fix it. So please be careful. Back to videography though, the Ultra can shoot HDR video, which is video in high dynamic range at up to 4K 30 frames per second with all three cameras. Now I can't really show you exactly what it looks like in this video on YouTube, but this is a screen recording of a video recorded without HDR. And this is with HDR. The Ultra can also shoot at up to 8K resolution, which you think is 8 times 1080p HD, at least that's what I thought. I mean, it just sounds right, but no. Technically, it is 16 times 1080p HD. That is crazy. I think 1080p is perfectly fine and sharp. I mean, that's the screen mode I was using on the Ultra's display, but its camera can shoot 16 times as sharp. A cell phone. Are you gonna wanna use this though? Well, no. <laughs> I don't think there's anything particularly wrong with it. I mean, it shoots at 24 frames per second, and it seems like the Ultra does a good job at shooting 8K. Although I do feel like it's struggling sometimes, but I don't blame it. It's shooting 16 times HD. Well, I think so, because I'm actually kind of taking its word for it. Because I've looked and looked and looked, and I can't see how sharp it really is, you know? I mean, I don't have any 8K displays lying around to properly check. And even if I did, like, can my eyes actually see that? I don't know. If there was one way I think it'd be useful though, it'd be just to be able to record a video and then later pick a frame for the video and just use it as a picture. Like a 33 megapixel picture, like Samsung said. But, I don't know, it doesn't look as good as I'd like. And I'd rather use the really fast burst mode camera, which takes pictures way faster than 24 frames per second and uses up way less space. The Ultra also lets you shoot slow motion video, but the ultra wide and zoom cameras don't work for this. Surprisingly, the front camera does though. I'm not sure exactly how many frames per second all the cameras are using, and I wasn't able to find that info anywhere, but it does look good, so I'm not stressing. If you want to record super slow mo though, then your Ultra will be worse than the regular S20s, because it'll record at half the resolution, 720p, and half the frame rate, 480 frames per second. And then it'll try to digitally double it back to 1080p and 960 frames per second. It looks cool still, I guess, but you know your Ultra is not as good, you know, it's not a good feeling. But lastly, the Ultra lets you shoot videos with voice commands. Capture, cheese, smile, record video. It works pretty well and it works with photos as well. I've been able to take some great pictures and videos with the S20 Ultra in good and bad light. But here's the thing, I took all these pictures with the pre-update camera and not with the post-update camera. Why? Well, because at the moment, the pre-update camera might as well be called the Snapdragon or American model, and the post-update camera might as well be called the Exynos or International model. That's right, the updates haven't come to all the S20 Ultras yet. Actually, some have started hitting the American Snapdragon Ultras, but it hasn't hit mine yet. Since this update can, and it looks like it already has changed the Ultra's camera a significant amount, I can't show you all the intensive tests I did with the Ultra and let you experience it the way it is because as soon as the update lands for everyone's phones in the following days, the test will be inaccurate. It'll be a lie. Well, some of it would. I mean, we can assume Samsung's not going to take something good from the cameras right now and make it worse in the update, right? Well, there's some things that are already good in the pre-update Ultra right now. Stuff like 4K video, which goes up to 60 frames per second, but it doesn't work with the ultra wide and zoom cameras. They can only go to 30 frames per second but it does surprisingly work with a front camera. Or does it? The front facing camera can shoot 4K 60 frames per second. Yes, but when you watch it back, you see that it's like, it's not exactly 4K, but it is 60 frames per second. But you, you look closely, it's just, my skin's just a little too smooth. It doesn't, it's not exactly 4K, you know, it's not that sharp. It says it is, and it is. I mean, I look at it, I look at the details, 
when I look at the shot and it's it says it's 4k but it's not but it says it is but it's not it's crazy at 4k 30 frames per second though then it actually looks kind of legit you know my skin is not that smooth you can actually see like like everything it's supposed to be very sharp 4k is not supposed to be that flattering unless your your skin is that flattering my skin is not bad but now you can actually see all the spots and everything because it's actually sharp it's actually 4k 60 frames per second it's not you know it's it says it is but it's not anyways the front camera takes pretty good selfies in good light and i thought the wider front camera was only slightly wider but it's actually wider than i thought overall with a selfie camera i don't really have complaints i do have complaints in apps like instagram and snapchat though i'm recording this on instagram right now and this does not look like a camera that can record in 4k not at all I mean, if you used Android before, then you know that this isn't exactly new, but Android phones like the Pixels don't have this problem anymore. Even the back cameras are just... <sighs> you can't use the ultra wide camera or the zoom camera either. Samsung used to have a feature where the camera app was connected to Instagram, so you didn't have limitations, but that's gone from the entire S20 series now. You can't use the ultra wide or the zoom camera. About that zoom camera though, the major, major hyped and marketed part of this phone the one that's supposed to be able to take 100 times zoom pictures and Samsung advertises it like it actually does it well. Actually, no, Samsung advertises it like it does it perfectly. Well, let's see how it actually performs. In good light, it's actually not that bad. I mean, look at this picture, pretty nice, right? What's that in the distance though? Can you see that far? I can't see that far. Let's go a little closer. Is that a bird, a plane? Let's get a little closer, a good bit more. Yup, 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 just like I thought. It's a person. Looks like my friend, but I gotta see his face clearly. Let's go a little closer. Ooh, he does look familiar. Can we get a little closer? Yup, 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 yup. I do not know this man. <laughs> okay, I'm joking, that's my friend. But you see how the Ultra actually does a good job in good light? You can see his face clearly. And remember, we started from here. I think it stays great only to a five times zoom though. Like great, no quality loss or nothing. And then from there it stays good till about 10 times zoom. It stays decent till about 30 times zoom. And it's kind of bad, but surprisingly still usable from there to the 100 times zoom. As far as real life usability, or you can use it as a stalker, or you can not do that and use it to read signs and stuff far away. It works pretty well, but that's in good light. How does it perform in low light though? Well, horrible. It is bad in low light. The ultra wide isn't so great either. Only the main camera is natively good in low light. What's crazy though, is that all three cameras are just about the best cameras I've used in low light. Doesn't make sense, right? I just said they're horrible. Well, I haven't shown you it's night mode yet. They have about the best, most drastic night mode I've ever seen. It takes the ultra wide shot from this to this. It takes the main camera shot from this to this and it even takes a terrible shot from the zoom camera from this to this it's impressive it also works on a selfie camera but it's not that impressive there it's a bit hard to pose and keep the camera steady as well i think using the flash is better with the front facing camera the flash on the back cameras act weirdly though if you ever use flash in a dark situation you know they come on then the camera adjusts and focuses and then it takes a picture well the ultra doesn't do this Instead, it lets the flash surprise it out of nowhere and then just takes the pic when it's not fully ready. This can lead to a bunch of bad shots and there's really no reason it should be this way. Hopefully, the update has and will fix this. I mean, there's nothing even hard to fix. Other camera apps, even Instagram, would do this the right way. It's just weird. And you can say the same about the overall pre-update camera. You know it's amazing hardware-wise, like you can shoot 8K, 16 times full HD but then it's not good enough to focus? Like, it's just weird. That is fixed now though, so it really shouldn't be a problem anymore. But because of the news floating around and the actual disappointment by S20 Ultra owners and reviewers in the pre-update camera, many people think the camera is the weakest link right now. We definitely need to test it, yes, but there should be no reason to think like this anymore. The days of the weak link pre-update camera is coming to an end. It's actually already ended for some people. Even with the pre-update camera though, you can still take great pictures and videos, I mean, you've seen it yourself. The strongest link though, or the best part of the S20 Ultra to me, is most definitely how it performs. The user experience, how the phone actually works. You might come for the 100x zoom camera, but you will stay for the user experience. Cause day in, day out, 
the ultra is smooth it has been very very smooth even with my intense intense use i mean snapchat feels smoother than it does on iphones snapchat if you've used Snapchat on Android in the past, then you understand the magnitude of that statement. A big part of this is because of the 120Hz refresh rate. That's why I told you that's the mode you want to use. The smoothest device I had ever used before the Ultra was the iPad Pro. It also has a 120Hz refresh rate screen, and if you know the iPad Pro, you know how smooth it is. That means you also understand the magnitude of the statement I'm about to make. The Samsung Galaxy S20 Ultra is the smoothest device I've ever used smoother than the iPad Pro. The iPad has a variable refresh rate where it's on 120 hertz when it needs to be and then reduces itself when it doesn't need to be that high, you know, for battery reasons and performance, you know? I thought it did this perfectly and as far as I knew, it was basically always on 120 hertz and when it wasn't, it was smart enough to hide it from me. That's what I thought. But then I used the Ultra, which is actually always in 120 hertz mode and I could tell it is the smoother device. I also remember the days Samsung phones used to be known for lag. I mean, many Samsung phones in the past lagged on me like crazy, but the Ultra is actually dependable, at least in my testing. I didn't experience any lag even when sliding to the Flipboard newsfeed at the left of the screen. You don't know how many Samsung phones had that problem in the past. It was like clockwork. That's not all though. The gestures you can use to maneuver the phone are actually good now too. They match the Pixel phones where you just slide up to go home, slide from the leftmost or rightmost side to go back, and slide up and hold to multitask. Kind of like iPhones as well. And when you do want to multitask, it's great because apps won't close in the background. The Ultra has way too much RAM for that. This one has 12 gigabytes, but you can take it up to 16 gigabytes. And you can also choose up to three apps you want to never close, and the Ultra will give it dedicated RAM. But see, if you use the Ultra, you wouldn't have to worry about apps closing. It's just not a problem. You also don't have to worry about going to settings because you can access almost everything you need from the notification bar. I mean everything. You can fully mess with Wi-Fi, fully mess with Bluetooth, turn on the blue light filter, customize it on the spot. It also now has the inbuilt screen recorder here and you can mess with its settings too. That's not all though. There are also other features that add to the user experience that you might not know about. There's Quick Share, which is supposed to be like AirDrop for Samsung devices. I don't know how good this works though because people around me don't have Samsung phones for me to test with. They have edge panels, which is actually very useful and has like 10 plus features in one. You can use it not just for app shortcuts, but for multitasking shortcuts too. You can set and stack all your reminders here for easy access. Oh, I almost forgot. Remember to subscribe if you'd like to see videos like these in the future. Oh, and you need to turn on all notifications for the channel. If not, YouTube might not show you the videos. Oh, and stay safe out there, okay? Wash your hands so you don't catch anything, okay? Anyways, with the edge panels, you can also store up to the last 20 things you've copied so you can paste later. It even stores screenshots. You can also control your music from here. It has to be Samsung music though. You can have easy access to the weather, create GIFs, keep track of the amount of something, use your flashlight, control how bright it gets, see how flat a surface is, use a compass, use a ruler, and you can get much, much, much more stuff from the Galaxy Store. The Ultra also has Samsung Pay, which is like Apple Pay and Google Pay, except that it works anywhere cards are accepted. I mean, anywhere at all, as long as it can get close enough to the card reader, that is. It has a native secure folder where you can hide things you don't want people to see, and you can lock it with your fingerprint and a password, pattern, or passcode. It has a music share feature where if you're playing music connected to Bluetooth, like in your car or something, if your friend wants to play some music, you don't have to disconnect and then reconnect him. They could just connect and play through you or through your phone. Sounds cool, but I never got to actually try it myself. So let me know if you have and how it works. What I did try though is Bixby. Now you activate it by pressing and holding the power button. Actually, it's not really a power button anymore. I mean, out the box at least, because no matter how you press it, double press it or hold it, it won't turn your phone off. You can always change this though. People say Bixby is bad and they have a point. See, I really gave it a chance, but it doesn't understand me well. Watch. Hey Bixby, what's up? I just want to know how you're doing today. understand that yeah i didn't think so there's a cool thing it does though whereas your keyboard's up and you're typing you just hold down the bixby button and speak like a walkie talkie and it just writes down stuff for you this is one of the coolest things about bixby but it's hard to use when it doesn't understand you so well it has something called bixby routines though and that one has potential you don't need to talk to it you just set it to do if and then things like for example to save battery at night you set it to if it's 9 p.m 
and my battery is not charging, then turn on medium power saving mode. There are many automations you can set with this. The Ultra also has a kids mode, and when you get into it, you can't leave unless you use your fingerprint or pin or pattern or password, and it has some fun stuff to keep kids occupied. You can play with it too if you want, I mean, no judgment. You can make your voice sound like anything you want. It's actually pretty fun. For you though, not for me. You wanted to do this, not me. You. Anyways, there's a more serious mode called focus mode for when you're done playing around in kids mode and you pick only certain apps you want to be able to use and the ultra will block and even gray out every other app. It'll block your notifications and it's to keep track of how long you've been focusing. You can always leave focus mode by pressing end focus mode and you might think that defeats the purpose, that's what I thought, but you have to see your progress on the screen and feel guilty about not being serious. A very serious and underrated feature that I respect though is Samsung DeX. It's basically supposed to be like you have a computer in your phone. I know this sounds ambitious, especially coming from Samsung, but surprise surprise, it is actually great. You plug it into your laptop, monitor, or even TV using a dongle and it seamlessly connects. If you don't have a mouse and you didn't connect it to your laptop with a keyboard and a trackpad, you can use the Ultra itself as the trackpad. Pretty cool. As far as the actual performance, it performs great and the overkill specs in the Ultra really shine here. It combines your phone and your computer into one and makes it kind of a dream device where you can have access to everything your phone could do but now in a more powerful computer way. Not all apps have been optimized for it though, but Samsung lets you force the apps to comply and go full screen or whatever when you want it to. You can open apps and apps and apps and apps and it still won't stutter. It performs great. It's best when you use a dongle and HDMI though, because the USB-A to USB-C cable limits the refresh rate. And it's still consistent, but it's a feel choppy and laggy. USB-C to C is better, but even then, it didn't feel as smooth as HDMI. HDMI was best in my experience. You can even open up games and play them. I wouldn't use a laptop for this though, because a lot of Android games aren't optimized for mouse and keyboard. Way more games are optimized for controllers though, and if you're connected to a TV, the Ultra can really feel like its own console, and it handles any phone game you throw at it perfectly. Samsung also lets you connect to a whole bunch of TVs and smart devices. Sadly, I don't have a lot of smart devices right now, but I do have access to a TV, and it works really well for that. It even has a cool touchscreen thingy that's just way more fun to use than an actual remote. By itself though, it is very, very, very good for gaming. I put it on max graphics, max resolution, max frame rate, max everything on every game I played, and it didn't break a sweat. Even with the max settings on a game like Fortnite, I can run YouTube on top of it, playing a video while connected to Bluetooth headphones, and the Ultra still wouldn't drop frames. Fortnite limits it to 30 frames per second though, and it seems the Ultra is way more capable of handling more, so the real games that look the best are the ones that can run in 120 frames per second. Even then, they still don't bother the Ultra. It has a game booster feature as well, where it helps keep track of the temperature and RAM to give you the best experience. And you know what? I really did have the best experience. The 120 frames per second games played so, so, so smooth. The Ultra is just a very powerful phone. The most powerful phone I've ever used. It is very good. Still though, there's some not so good things about it that we haven't talked about. For one, face unlock. It's a good amount more consistent than it's been in the past, but it's not something I would rely on by itself. I mean, it works pretty well in favorable conditions, like in good lighting, and it actually works pretty consistently there. But it's in poor and bad lighting where it's inconsistent. I'm not saying it doesn't work, to be clear. I'm saying it's inconsistent. So you get used to it working great when the lights are on, and you get into sort of a seamless rhythm. As it gets darker and darker though, your rhythm gets thrown off. Like you think it'll have unlocked in a second like it usually does, and you think your phone's open, but nope. This time, you had to have waited two seconds. Next time, three seconds. The time after that, 3.7 seconds. Later, it's 1.674 seconds out of nowhere, and you think you can still trust it though, because it's not taking too long. I mean, 3.7 seconds is not a long time. And then next time, it'll just not work at all. Your own phone won't even recognize you. It's hurtful. Luckily for me and you, if you're an S20 Ultra owner, you can use it alongside the in-screen fingerprint sensor, which works pretty well. They do something else annoying though, at least to me. Every morning or middle of the night, like after you haven't used the phone for a good amount of hours, it won't accept face unlock or your fingerprint. Like it'll make you put in your password or pattern for security reasons. 
I mean, I, I like trying to keep my phone safe and it's really not a big deal, but it did annoy me like clockwork every time I woke up early or in the middle of the night, which happens a lot with me. I still like the phone though, you know, even with this and the whole camera thing, pre-update, post-update, everything, I still really like the phone. But you see, I try to make this video in a way that you kind of know how you felt about it because you'd have experienced the S20 Ultra throughout the video. So let me know what you think. Also, some of my friends wanted to know whether they should get the S20 Ultra or one of the regular S20s because the S20 Ultra is expensive, I know that. Now, I think in this video, you should have been able to basically almost hold the S20 Ultra in your hand. So you should know the answer to that question. But if you don't by any chance, one of my next videos will definitely, definitely help you with that. Definitely answer that question. Also, if you have any other questions about anything, in case I didn't cover anything, anything at all in this video, just leave it in the comment section below. You know, when my mom texts me, I get a notification on my phone. When you leave a comment, I get a notification on my phone right next to hers. So I plan to get back to my mom. So I plan to get back to you in the same exact way. Well, not the same exact way. I won't say, I won't say I love you though. Unless you say, for, no, 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 thanks for watching. It's not a contest. The S20 Ultra is the best phone I've ever used. It has some weird stuff going on at the moment, but no phone, I mean no phone, can do everything the Ultra can. Well, some basically can. Wait, the S20 Ultra is the best S20, right? Right? Right?